So, hello everyone and welcome to the Stuart Podcast. I'm your host Ross Baxter and today is episode 79 of the series. Uh, as always, the Student, uh, the Student Art Podcast is a weekly series where I bring on guests from the film and game industries to talk about their journey and thoughts on education. Today on the show, we've got an amazing guest for you. We've got Oliver Walker on the show. How's it going, man? Thanks for coming on. Hello, hello. It's great to great to be here, and I um, hope hopefully we can have uh, a nice in depth conversation from everything from game design to I hear we might be talking about Dungeons and Dragons. So something Perfect. to be very excited about. Can't wait. It's going to be so much great discussions because uh, I was telling uh, Oliver at the start like there's so much things I've got prepared, and uh, dude, I think I've prepared too much for this one. <laughs> there's so much stuff. Well, to, there's so much stuff to talk about. It's great. <laughs> can can you ever be too prepared? I I. I don't know if that's that's the thing. That we'll is very see. true. We'll that see. is a good point. So, um, as always, folks, um, like I said, it's our podcast weekly series where I bring on guests, etc. So today we're going to be diving into Oliver's background, etc. And diving into game design, you name it. So enjoy, and uh, let's just get straight to it, man. So Absolutely, um, happy to go for it. First things first, just a uh, good old introduction. Tell us a wee bit about yourself, so like what you do exactly. Sure thing. So, uh, game and level designer so my kind of specialist skills are prototyping level design and mission design so um, i've done a number of professional projects now um first project i ever did was a like a vr jenga game it was a puzzle game for a company called roost games uh, which is now radical forge um still very good friends with a lot of the people there and i I uh, visit them a lot and offer feedback on their current projects and it's it's nice to be you know it's, it's nice to have a relationship with the studio like that it's um really something special um, um other than that you know i do um bits of freelance game design and uh, currently my full-time gig is at just add water mm-hmm. um working on a brand new installment in the sniper elite series built from the ground up for vr platforms wow oh dude uh, you like, there's so many just in that uh like- a uh, few cents of conversation. Like, you have so many great topics, so we'll be diving into VR exactly. Uh, you name it. And uh, you mentioned the Jenga game, so I was checking out. And mm, yes. uh, by the way, I just got to say, like, first of all, a really cool idea for a game, really awesome. And then mm. the guy who did the voice audio, whoever did that, inc- <laughs> it made it that was so I, good. I, I I don't know exactly who that was, but that is a close friend of the studio. Um, right. And he uh, he actually wrote the script as well, I think, as, really? as well as right. doing the audio. I, I might be wrong on that, but I I, that, I believe that is the case. So, yeah. Um, quite an interesting one, that. Definitely. No, it was a really cool game. Like I was just checking out all the different games that you've worked on, and uh, we'll dive into that as well. So, Brilliant, like, yeah. When it came to just you as an artist, etc., uh, when was it like, like, when did it all start that it was game design that you wanted to do? <sighs> that's um, that's a, a brilliant one. little question. <laughs> um, I love that question. So... Um, you know, I've always kind of been drawn to video games and um, everything from, you know, the original Pokemon games on the Game Boy to, Mm -hmm. you know, more crazy stuff on the GameCube like Killer7. I've always been fascinated by like uh, digital digital art and like digital games because um, they kind of offer something like unique and engaging that maybe films and movies um, don't do in in quite the same way. but then sort of when I was a teenager, I was I was obsessed with Lego and like building and creating and designing and, and fine art and stuff. I um, was a big fine artist, still make time to draw and um, get engaged with the creative sides of things. Um, but I stumbled across, I was watching Zero Punctuation on The Escapist at the time. Okay. Because um, that was the only place you could watch it then. Um, and this new channel opened on the website called uh, Extra Credits, which Ooh. is now like one of the biggest, um, you know, game development youtube channels out there and it was it was really uh, eye-opening to me because it was a big like uh, it, it sometimes can be difficult to imagine people out there making games when you just see finished games but the fact that there was this group of people talking about games and game design i was just like enthralled in it um yeah and then that that led on to me uh, going to study at college and i went went to an open day and they were like look there's this course where you can learn 3d modeling programming design engine work and i was like oh my god <laughs> this is a dream come true i get to do that every single day yeah um and i um i worked my ass off at college i I loved it and it was a really really special time in my life because mm-hmm. i learned a huge amount creatively and I, I just got to make like basically the games of my dreams and mm-hmm. uh you know, you, you're still learning and stuff, but the early games that I did, I'm still, I'm still quite attached to them because, you know, you haven't got all these preconceived notions about what is and isn't right, and yeah, um, of course. So those projects are still quite special to me. But yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of like 
a little whirlwind tour um, of sort of my my uh, my early informative years as a games creator. Yeah, no, that, that's amazing. So just like speaking of being actually really cool to kind of just hear. So like mm-hmm. uh, when you were uh, making these games, uh, does any of those games stand out to you? Like uh, it'd be great to hear about one of them. Sure. So I did. Um, I did a game about like Catholic dogma. Okay. Um, and you, the the game is about um, essentially like what what your feelings t- are towards um, basically like it, you, how you feel towards like um, decisions you've made in your life and do okay. you do you have ownership over decisions that you've made and um, like what what part and what part does God play in that essentially yeah, yeah. okay um, and it was it was a, it was all about my experience with religion and um, growing up and yeah. Um, it was really nice to to make a game with that meant something to me and like allowed me to deal with uh, and express like my feelings about organized religion and stuff. Of um, course, that's um, great. Yeah, it was it was a it was for, considering how, like I'd only been making games for like a year to yeah it was actually a year. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really happy with it and I, I got to expo it with final year work. So like strangers were coming up and playing my game and yeah. giving and like it was it was that's always something special you know exposing a game um, definitely but yeah yeah that was um, you know I I usually when I'm making a game I like to try and resolve some kind of conflict I I have like because it's it's at the end of the day it is art mm-hmm. you know and you're trying to trying to work through something that you you want to understand better and, and that was one of those projects that really was definitely that for me yeah it's always like the creative like uh, like you said it's like you so many different ways of creating games there's so many uh, themes yeah. just different areas to explore and that's why it's Absolutely. so awesome having you on the show and uh, like we'll be able to dive into like the importance of story uh, level design even like mission uh, design etc etc because i only came for across sure. that like when i read so i like i've done so many podcasts and mm-hmm. I've never heard that term. I did not realize like that was like the term. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so mission design is a really interesting one because it's it's not actually, it's not uh, in, it's not necessarily level design. It's okay. usually like the structure and the actual scripting that takes place in a mission. So yeah. companies like uh, I shouldn't name drop too many companies, but um, there are massive companies out there that have very specific mission designers mm-hmm. so they 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 are and they are separate from level designers usually the mission and level designer is the same person at, at small and medium sized companies but the bigger a company gets the the bigger they can um the more resources they can split up and uh, mm-hmm. compartmentalize um perfect but yeah mission de- mission design is really cool uh, it, it's a really cool part of the pipeline and we're really lucky on sniper to um to get to get hands on with the level design, but also script all of our own missions and stuff, which is, mm-hmm. you know, really cool. Um, so yeah, like, re- yeah. When you're saying about like scripting and stuff, so I understand mm-hmm. that story in the day is like the main thing, I guess. So mm-hmm. when it comes to you, so what kind of control or obviously I won't tell it towards just like the studio, but in terms of, like if you had to mm-hmm. describe what um, the typical game designer does, like how would you kind of sum it up? Uh, is that is that just uh, the game design discipline as a whole, or sort of? Yeah, um, I would say okay, probably so, over as a, as a whole. I think that'd be like a good way yeah, to start. So okay, so um, game design as a whole is usually all about the minute to minute gameplay, and that can that can range and that can go off in many different directions. So mm-hmm. um, what's the player doing? How do they interact with the world? What do they interact with? What are their goals? What are their objectives? Um, yeah, get, game design is such a vast discipline and varies so much company to company. Yeah, um, it's 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 tricky to get specific while also being quite broad and generalist. So um, of course, but like uh, my sort of bread and butter and my what I what I enjoy the most is um, get it playable fast. Okay, interesting, right? Nice. I like the it. The sooner the sooner you can hand it off to a player, the better, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. Because you're not making games for yourself, you're designing games for players, and you want to give them uh, something to play as soon as you can. Yeah, because like, well, that's the thing. So when you said that, that just remembered. Um, quote me if I'm wrong. So I was looking through mm-hmm. your um, website, and uh, it was like making a game in ten minutes. It was like something along. Oh my those lines. gosh! 
What was that um, all about? Like that seemed crazy. What, am I completely off tangent, or because that was I, similar um, to what we're so talking I about? I actually, here. I have, I have done um, like our game jams before. Um, yeah, which are just meant messing about with friends and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you, you ultimately, if you have ten minutes to bake something, um, you you can do it, but you have to. Um, A lot <laughs> of thinking. Just, um, yeah, you have to focus what you want, and you could probably do like a playable. Um, I think a cool, a cool like spin on that would be like take an existing game like Rock Paper Scissors or Tic Tac Toe, mm-hmm. and then you get ten minutes to edit the rules, and then you come up with some with like a new variant of the game. That's that's kind of like uh, the sort of thing that you'll do at, um, at game design universities uh, yeah. in, in America. Really, it's not not that sort of thing. Uh, I I had some of that what, when studying, but. It's not as common over here as it in, is in the US. Um, yeah, yeah the, a lot of the UK courses are quite focused on uh, the practicalities um, and stuff. But but as to, to return to the ten minute game design thing, like game design exercises and challenges like that are amazing, and they're super super really good ways to actually like apply yourself and apply your skills to something practical. Um, mm-hmm. And like uh, game a month last year was like a big uh, test for me, and I did that for five months, and I got five games at the end of it, which was oh just my gosh, um, right. <laughs> yeah. It was it, I had to basically I had to stop in the end because I was just getting so burnt out, you know, coming home full day at work and then working on these games literally every every night and yeah, um, bringing them in every Friday for a playtest session. Um, yeah, like I think. Um, setting goals and setting like short time frames to finish something mm-hmm. can be an amazing way to grow as a creator whether you're an artist or a designer definitely like that was the thing because uh when you said there about the game jam side of things so mm. um i assume Ar- well aaron probably talked to you about this as well um so when i was uh back in Aberte, so we both went to Aberte, we had game jams there uh, and uh, yeah, g- yeah. game jams are like a, a great opportunity if you know what i mean and uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to getting involved etc you name it like there's so many um well then again it's, it, it depends if you know what i mean it's all down to uh like your situation and how kind of uh how many tools etc are available to mm. you and uh um like how important they are like have you had to say like what were, what were the beneficials of doing game jams for you uh for me it's about like concentrating and getting something playable and finished very very quickly you know like that's that's kind of one of my mantras in game design get get it playable and um mm-hmm. And the game jams are like a microcosm for that. It's um, super, super condensed, super tight. Everyone, you know, you should be able to. It's also a lesson in scope. Actually, that's a massive lesson for a game designer. Yeah. If a game designer isn't aware of how big an idea is, and you don't have to be spot on with it, but you should vaguely be aware of what it takes to implement what you're asking. Mm-hmm. And game jams are like a crash course in that and how to execute something in a time frame. Yeah. Like that's that's always been the thing as well because uh, so game jams have obviously they've been around for a while and uh, you mm-hmm. even see them on Twitch like you name it like they're they're yeah, like yeah. they are getting a lot bigger and like there's lots of events as well and uh, I realised that uh, you've got involved in a lot of events which is great to see like getting involved mm-hmm. getting out there and like for example doing talks like this um, you've been on podcasts so when it comes to like the talking side of things because this is one of the mm-hmm. topics I thought would be really important to talk about um, getting involved like what kind of events have you been to uh so uh, my event calendar is usually egx uh rezzed feral vector mm-hmm. um those are the big sort of the big ones like uh, rezzed and feral vector are my absolute favorites they're okay. unbelievable events feral vector is a bit more um it's quite an artistic event it's it's more i, I like to describe it as like a cultural event with a game spin right nice um, nice Really cool little event. I go. Uh, I've been going for about three years now. And then Rezd is sort of the indie-facing um, event in the Tobacco Docks, London, which is coming up next uh, month, uh, at the end of next month. Hopefully, it happens, but we'll fingers have to crossed. wait and see on that. Yeah. Yeah. Fingers crossed. You know. Um, but I've I've always loved doing the the events, and um, you know, I was going to um, like a uh, Yorkshire Games Festival, and I was going to. Um, gameo and stuff which is a networking event in yorkshire yeah i was going to that stuff when i was a student and it's funny um because i was a student for a long time um you know i did i did sort of college and then university mm-hmm. and everyone's always telling you network 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 and it didn't really sink in because i was doing all of that networking stuff and i was like oh, oh is this ever really going to pay off and be useful mm-hmm. and then in my third year i turned to uh someone like a professional who i knew and i was like uh hey bob man like um do you know anyone looking for game designers? And he was like, oh my God, yeah, go and speak to that guy over there. Oh, really? um, <laughs> awesome. Had a conversation. 
uh next week i had an interview and then the week after i had a job um amazing <laughs> yeah it was um you know it, 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 it's on it's it's a cliche at this point to be like hey do some networking but literally yeah. like um a, a great deal of my professional opportunities freelance um full-time work all that stuff has come from being at events and knowing people and having those conversations mm -hmm. so i i can't recommend that enough you've got to get stuck in and you know talk to people meet people um learn things from people and have those good conversations yeah yeah of course that's always the thing because uh, i can tell just by talking to you you're good at talking and having that skill and the ability like doing the presentations that you've done in the past etc just speaking of talking like um like for example i know a lot of um students out there maybe struggle at maybe doing a presentation or mm -hmm. getting themselves out there or maybe just uh for example like you said uh, going up to talk to, to someone about a job like what are the mm -hmm. things have you learned from maybe past mistakes or like what advice would you give students uh, i've got so much to say about that so first and foremost uh i do not have a perfect track record when it comes to uh public speaking and okay. um presenting at all you know I, i'm uh, you know i've given i gave presentations at uni that just like i I, I thought i had it in the bag and i just totally bombed it when i got up there and then um i've also given talks where you know i've been like the the setup has been very intimidating and okay. the delivery has been uh, okay like i've never i've never done a talk that i've been really unhappy with but i've given lots of talks that i've been like oh i could have been better you know um and the the thing about it is every time you give a talk or a presentation or you come on a podcast you learn you learn something from it you you gain that little bit more confidence as well mm -hmm. and as you keep doing it and keep going into those um those opportunities to speak and converse um you're going to improve little by little um so maybe you're not a natural but if you stick at it and don't avoid the opportunities to present and talk and um, share your perspective, you will improve. And that is, that's just critical to me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Because like at the day, um, like you nailed it there perfectly. I've always felt that, or like the way I've always approached it, and I've said it in the podcast and the, uh, previously, etc., is that I always like to throw myself in the deep end and make myself uncomfortable. Because mm -hmm. the more times you get uncomfortable, the better you become, um, like you said. Yeah. And I uh, understand that we all have different levels of confidence, etc., just based off our situation, you name it, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, like Oliver is saying, it's like, until you try it, you're not going to be able to identify the mistakes. And most importantly, you're not going to be able to get more relaxed. And sure. like that's always the thing, like to me, like it goes such a long way. Like for example, there's been many talks, um, very interesting talks in which I've heard people say that people have been able to maybe get a job over someone more talented purely because they're almost not, I'm not trying to say like they bluffed their way through it, but they were able to mm. talk their way through to convincing people. of you know Yes. I mean? Yes. Okay. So that's, that's a brilliant point because people forget that um, the skills are a massive, is massive. You know, you, it's not to be understated in the slightest. Mm -hmm. However, um, people have to remember that you will be sitting next to you and conversing and collaborating with people and your ability to be personal plays a huge role in that yeah massive role in that um for sure yeah because like and a day it's just like like the great thing is like so this is one of the really cool things by the way we're going to be talking about in it uh shortly so we're going to be talking about dungeons and dragons and oh. we're going to be talking about every yeah <laughs> you're like here we go <laughs> oh i'm in, <laughs> I'm exc in. excitement time here we go uh, just like when it comes to like uh like the whole talking aspects like the mm. like, this is so this is one thing i'm not sure what your thoughts on this so every time yeah. i'm talking to someone right um so i always try to how can I say it? Judge the scenario quite quickly. For example, I'm quite mm -hmm. a naturally a loud person. So, and it's down to knowing when to be loud, if you know what I mean. So, mm -hmm. when I'm talking to people, trying to figure it, and this, and this is what I found important through my years of doing talks, etc., and just talking to people is mm -hmm. if you're struggling about talking about someone, just it's going to sound so obvious, but I always be myself or I say something yeah, that I'm yeah. passionate about, and people are like, be, oh yeah, but I need a certain phrase in that. No, just literally just be yourself or like mm -hmm. find a conversation starter that's going to make it easy for you to at least have something to talk about. And yeah, like, you, you, even yeah, if yeah. things don't come out straight away, it's okay. Like sometimes like when you're doing yeah. presentations, people always are so, um, like I understand that or being organized is important, but they always have like their notes, if you know what I mean? And they're like, right, I must follow these notes. But normally oh, yeah. the best thing yeah. is just being natural about it and uh, just letting <clears throat> things flow. And uh, but once again, obviously it ties back to being 
being patient and uh, the more you do obviously the more better you become mm-hmm. like for example dude if i t- if i showed you my first podcast i did it was just like it wasn't bad but it was just like i said m about two thousand times so i've i've been like um kind of like sitting on trying to do a podcast for a little bit as well myself you know i got okay. um i got the jingle recorded and everything and i like oh, nice. tried sitting tried sitting down to record it and stuff but it's about getting something that you're you're happy with but at the same time as that you like your point was um you you will naturally improve by throwing yourself in the deep end and taking mm-hmm. on slightly more than you can chew um this this reminded me of a piece of advice i heard from one of the guys in the dynasty group actually so um i i wasn't actually at this event but my friend was talking to me about um, some of the conversations he had Ooh, nice. and he was ba- he basically said um he got some advice saying sort of in the first five years of your career you should try and jump studios like two or three times because what that does is it's, it throws you in at the deep end multiple times and you're yeah. forced to you're forced to rapidly improve and rapidly meet new uh, standards and quality bars especially if you're you know moving up the pecking order um mm-hmm. i found i just found that like uh, you know i think that's a piece of advice that's worth sharing because yeah um it really resonated with me and i can't i can't help but feel that you know jumping in at the deep end is is an is an amazing thing because yeah. um wh- when i started at jaw I had never done 3D level design, um, which is just outrageous. But um, I, I was I, sorry. I say I'd never done 3D level design. I'd done like the standard amount that you do at university. I wasn't like yeah. a full-on level design nut, um, but my my other skills were pretty strong. Um, however, it was a period of of you know the two years that we've been on the project has been like absolute trial by fire building building these levels and getting levels up to like what is essentially triple a vr standard Mm -hmm. for for something and i was just like oh my gosh this is this it was such trial by fire (laughs) absolutely in the truest sense of the word um but like you said you know you've got to jump in at the deep end and you can't be afraid of it because it's how you grow and it's how you build your skills quickly um yeah i just wish uh more universities kind of put you into a situation like that if you know what I mean I think it'd be kind of cool to see people like yeah. right let's have like a, a mock test or something or this like just randomly out of nowhere like a lecture just goes right yeah. tell me about yourself and you're just like wait what what's going on <laughs> yeah I, I I have kind of like a fantasy about like the whole university education system of like about like how I would like to see it change and evolve um, oh, I'm glad I'm, it'd be great to hear um okay so um I I, I think it, the games education system is so varied and vast um it but but my biggest issue is with it is um and this is actually a, pro- a wider university problem it's mm-hmm. just the lack of um it, it, it's the lack of the feeling that these courses don't have to get rid of people um if you're not doing the work they they just let you finish the course regardless and that does it does a disservice to the hard-working students because why are they bothering if you can pass a module in an afternoon yeah um and as well as that, you know, um, y- if you do a course for three years and you barely do anything, you get your degree at the end of it and you've got no skills, mm-hmm. you, you, that's a massive disservice to you as a young person um, yeah, because you, you could have spe- you've got all this debt and you've got no skills out of it because, um, because you weren't forced to apply yourself. Um, mm-hmm. But I, 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 w- one day I fully intend to, um, to go into teaching because I, I, I love, I love, you know, I like, like we've talked about, um, I loved the the lecturing side of things, and um, I, I'm a big believer in like uh, education as a whole, um, and, the, and sharing and sharing knowledge. Um, you know, I, I love I love teaching, and I I, I ran um, some some workshops while I was at university, and it was it was really satisfying. I loved doing yeah. it. Um, that's great. No, but it... yeah, that, that's that's quite a microcosm of some of my feelings towards the, the the education system, and it's a it's a pretty big and complicated topic. Yeah. Um, for sure um but yeah those are those are some just sort of like some drops of the... in the drops in the bucket you know yeah, yeah. well like, that's what was the well in the day like i'm really glad you said it because that's what this podcast is all about it's all about mm. trying to like the one thing it would be great though is like uh, or it's one thing obviously I've, i tried to do and uh, i know um a bunch of my lecturers uh listen to the podcast and um mm. like i understand like there's like there's so many great lectures like there's lots of people yes, really putting absolutely. the time in but then there's also the places that obviously are the opposite and it's so hard to kind of know yeah. um yeah. and obviously like doing a podcast is great and all like i, I do my <clears> best <throat> to help people out and stuff but yeah. there's 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 that next step that has to be made and that 
gets to, um, that can only be applied through the people who run all the main things and it's trying to get mm-hmm. like your voice heard etc like that's why what you For do sure, yeah. like doing these talks etc are really important like even if you're just talking to for, for example doing a presentation in front of half an hour uh, to like 30 people mm-hmm. like that's still 30 people that you've reached if you know what i mean like that's still oh something. absolutely yeah yeah i um when i was a student i got so much out of the um the industry lectures um mm-hmm. so much um and uh you know like like i i i have this actually, I, I quite like to tell this story actually because i have this distinct memory in first year mm-hmm. we oh, have this uh, at teesside we have this event called animex and the university brings in like speakers from all over the world to come and talk so uh there was an animator from valve um there was uh, ken wong who did monument valley um and there was like people from star citizen they were showing off the tech that they were building for the early the early stuff on star citizen right and um it was out unbelievably inspirational you know listening to these people talk and give their perspectives and um i i, I couldn't help but feel like uh, like uh, if i'm completely honest just like woefully inadequate and yep. um and those feelings um sort of pushed me on and i was like well if i'm not good enough now i've got to be I've got to be able to get to that point by the end of my, my education. Otherwise, you know, what, what's the point? And Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that kind of like everyone gets something out of listening to those perspectives and you know, that sort of fire sort of lit in my belly was, uh, was really special. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm immensely grateful to everyone that volunteers their time to do podcasts and give talks and, and everything because it, it's it's been a huge part of my journey as a game developer mm-hmm. well like it's always been um like i'm, I'm really ha- thanks for telling us that because uh, it's always like the how can i say it or put, put it politely it's like the harsh kind of reality sometimes needs to kick in in order to get anything yeah, yeah, anything yeah. rolling and uh like that's always like a thing that you see like when you said um about like people just going through universe uh, university as and just going through the motions just for the sake of it and then yeah. it hits them at the end yeah. and they're just like wait what have i done and then they're yeah. like trying to figure out to their family or trying to explain uh why they've not got a job and yeah, that. yeah. And, but it's, the... it's, it's it's horrible isn't it you know yeah um i i can't i i I really, really struggle with that um, mm-hmm. because, like the the you know the the like Andrew Ryan in me thinks of <laughs> of just like um, the ideal games course. You know, um, Andrew Ryan is the complete wrong person to say that because Rapture falls and is is a wasteland by the end of it. But anyway, anyway, poor poor analogy. But what I was going to say is, if I was to put my you know idealist hat on, mm-hmm. um, the the way courses should probably be run is in your first year it should be really, really hard to pass. Okay. Uh, and the the idea of that is if you can pass the first year, you know, you're you're like you're you've got a good shot at getting a job. Because if they if they did it that way, people wouldn't spend three years doing something that they they're not gonna succeed at, you know. And you can always tell you, I think you can always tell when students are gonna make it or not. Yeah. You know, we always meet people who, you know, you can just tell, you know, they're going places, you know, they They've got the work. They've got the skills. They've got the personality. Yeah. Um. And I think the courses do a disservice by, um, by letting everyone through and and, oh. and kidding everyone because they're, yeah. they're kidding everyone, aren't they? You know. And and like I had an amazing time at university, and my lecturers, I I, I owe pretty much my career to my college and university lecturers. Mm-hmm. I don't don't doubt that for a second. You know. But the system as a whole, and it's not the lecturer's fault. It's just it's the actual system behind it all. Yeah. Um. And it's so difficult um, and it's so tricky. Um, yeah. But I have, I have pretty strong strong feelings and thoughts about this whole stuff. Um, and I'm, I, it's nice to share them, but sort of part of me feels like I might be you know, Dude, wandering onto some it's... lovely thin <laughs> ice. But what can I say? I can't, I can't help but give you, give you my... I'm not going to you know, spin, spin, spin lies and spin yarns. I, I want to be transparent and candid. Well, like, this is the thing. Like, this is great because at the end of the day, it's always about, um, like, everyone has a different story and different perspective. And for sure. It's, it's where, like, everyone who's tuning in, they learn from all these different stories. And like, you said something that was really interesting because uh, this ties into uh, something I never heard before uh, from another guest that came on uh, very recently. And mm. uh, basically he was saying that there's so many universities just accepting so many students. And okay, they, and right. Like, there's just yeah. too many people. And it's like, so imagine I, having uh, like, yeah. lecturers having like, I don't know, like 60 students when it's, so, like, it's 20 absolutely. or 30, it'd be yeah, so yeah. much easier. <laughs> I know. So this this is hit the nail on the head. So I, I went back to do some mentorship and uh, a game jam at my college. And, 
when I was at college, you had to work your ass off to mm -hmm. make your portfolio, to get your skills, and to get into university. It was a, it used to be quite hard to get onto a university course. Yeah. Um, but that over time has got it has gotten easier and easier and easier to the point now where these college students don't even have to finish their course and they're getting unconditional offers. And what that means is they're not spending the time developing their skills, mm -hmm. and that is just. I, I owe so much of my success to the time I spent at college working and, and making stuff and creating stuff. And the fact that these kids, these, these young kids are just getting accepted onto these courses and they're like, oh, I don't even have to bother with my college work anymore mm -hmm. and just, you know, throw it in the bin, you know. It's, it's completely, it's outrageous and it's a big failing of the system because yeah. if you don't force students to work hard to get into university, why are they going to work hard when they get there? Yeah. If they don't have the, the, the personal drive and some people need that extra push to, you know, to develop those skills, it, oh, this, this is, yeah, this really... It breaks my heart because the games industry is already competitive, and if the universities aren't really like, you know, creating these absolute, you know, balls of energy and burning passion, yeah, it, it it's a it's a disservice to young people. Definitely, because you know? like, and I'm really glad that this is um. So our paths are similar in a sense. So I started in mm -hmm. college first, and then I mm -hmm. went into university. So I got into university my third year. So I went to college first college first and second year and yeah, yeah. when i was in college like it was the hands down same like you like, mm -hmm. my first year was literally one of the coolest years of my life and um, because oh same it, same it was yes. like dude it was so sick like it was just like everyone was like geeking out like about um 3d non-stop like everyone was there just having full-on passion oh, that sounds and, so great and that sounds like, fantastic. oh man and then this is the top thing right so my whole background is sport okay and so mm -hmm. when i came here i was like uh, into the class um so there was about 30 of us and I didn't have a Game Boy or any of this kind of thing, but 20, every other, no joke, everyone in my class was playing Game Boys and that, and like Nintendo DS. Oh my gosh, so everyone was just wow. geeking out. And um, this is why I think the college route is great. And it depends, mm. though. It Once again, it, it does, though, depend. It does depend, absolutely. You so, know, if you, you can get, you can get a rough, uh, you can get a rough um, draft of things if you of course. don't go to a solid college. Um, mm -hmm. Because you, the like university, the the quality of courses um, varies a great deal. Um, but sorry, what were you saying? Um, so what I was going to say was that um, when I was in college, right, I learned, uh, like you said, about learning so many skills, like the actual mm. practical side of things. And most importantly, it was like I, ne I needed uh, to be successful there in order to get into uni, to get the yeah, degree, yeah. etc. Even though the degree isn't really... Well, actually, this will be... Because I'm not sure what is uh, on your side of things. So when it comes to mm -hmm. game design, how important is the degree? Uh, it opens a lot of doors for you and it gives you time to build a portfolio and your skills and knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. There's kind of like a base level of knowledge that you need as a game designer and it is a okay. good way to obtain that knowledge by going to uni and being surrounded by people who understand the game's culture mm -hmm. and the the, uh, the game design you know, theories and practices. And um, You can learn a lot of it online and through textbooks and stuff, but um, for me personally... Um, I I loved university. I loved lectures. I loved you know being that guy at the front who's always got a question. Yeah, <laughs> that was I was one hundred percent that guy. Me too, man. Um, me too. Always the best. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you um you you certainly earn a reputation doing that. Um, but yeah, um, it, it's it's a tricky one because I hear there are so many good online courses now. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you could build the structure to sort of spend three years of your own time, you know, training to be a level designer, and they say that's what you wanted to do and you spent three years just literally you know working your ass off doing a nine to five every day you know you you could you could get incredible results by doing that mm -hmm. um and i know i actually know a game designer who was at college and did a placement and then got taken on full time oh, she wow, is mate. a really fantastic game designer um amazing. and you know that that is an amazing story um of course and if you if you get the option and the opportunity you obviously jump on it like embrace it with both arms because it's um big opportunity is that if you can if you can you know get hands-on experience because there's there's kind of like in game design there's kind of almost two schools when it comes to things mm -hmm. it's like practical game design and theoretical game design and they overlap but they're not necessarily the same thing because um for example a game designer that's made a bunch of games but knows no theory mm -hmm. 
is also it can be good and a, a, theor- a game designer who knows a bunch of theory but hasn't made games can also be good in certain projects it's it's like there's like but the, the in my opinion the best the, the best kind of game designer is someone who's split in the middle okay. you know has some theoretical knowledge but is also very practical as well um so when yeah it comes in, to... interesting stuff there though no no that's a great topic that uh, actually leads on to my next question so thanks for saying Brilliant. that um so when it comes to game design what would mm-hmm. you think uh, like what's like uh, i know it's obviously it's easy for me to say like what's the requirements but maybe i should twist it a wee bit what would you think university should do more to get more game designers being successful like what kind of like what's kind of expected uh, would you say for a game designer wow that's an amazing little question um i think um i think you have to have the ability to understand and break down problems and understand effective solutions um and also um a lack of genre bias as well like if you if you're just like if you're just like i only like this type of game that could hamstring you as a game designer because you're not you're not thinking about the best solution you're thinking about the best solution for a given genre um as as for what the universities can do I, i i think um I think they need to really dive deep on the modules rather than give a surface level understanding. So at my uni, there was a UI module and we absolutely rinsed UI. You know, mm-hmm. we, we learned we learned so much about UI on that module. That was by, by a guy who works at Sumo Digital now, um, Jamie Smith, really great lecturer. It was amazing, amazing to learn under him. Um, and that, that module was not just... Um, a baseline understanding of what UI is, how it functions, what it what it can be used for, what it can't be used for. Um, it was it was it was a deep dive as well as as just the surface level stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think if they can do that for say uh, level design, mission design, prototyping, UI, game loops, um, if they, if all of the modules are not just a, a surface level understanding, if they start to sort of dive deep and go into those more complex um, elements of game design Mm -hmm. you know it would be be tenfold you know we'd see we'd see you know game designers really succeeding especially if they're building little examples of their own design as for like finished finished pieces so if if we if we did a a game design course of um sort of those topics we discussed and for every single one of those there is a playable or at least a video example of the work Mm -hmm. and it shows how that person designs it shows the way they think um we would start to see more and more success from um, game design students. And if I'm honest, the really successful game design students, that's actually what they're doing already. Yeah. Wow, what an answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is great. It's all right. No problem well, at I, all. I, that, you was, know, this that was an amazing answer. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is my, this is like, I, I, I like live and breathe and obsess over this stuff. So I'm, I'm, absolutely it's it's my absolute pleasure to come on a show to to discuss this with you ross you know Th- I, thanks, I dude. love it because yeah. oh dude i've got so many questions i, I can't wait to ask, uh, to ask them so uh carrying on this theme so this is one thing because like i said to you at the start like i'm still like uh, i'm still a rookie in this kind of uh, the game design sort of role because my main thing is like the art side of things in the sense yeah, that yeah. even though game design is art um, but I'm very, uh, I'm a, like no, a sculptor, no, you, et cetera. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I totally get you, yes. So the question I wanted to ask, and it's one thing that I, I see um, getting asked quite a lot. So what is the difference, uh, another difference question, uh, what's the difference between game design and game development? Because sometimes I hear that there is a wee yes, bit of a difference. Okay. Yes, so uh, development usually refers to the holistic approach of creating the the game as a whole so development is usually you can prescribe development as like the code the design and the art it, it, this is my definition and, and people's definitions vary you know some mm-hmm. people refer to developers as purely the programmers but um developer for me means anyone who is actively working on the game whether that's qa production art um any of those departments you know um and then design is um is all about sort of the mechanics of the game. So, you know, um, so on, on Babel Tower to the Gods, it was like the mechanics of the game are you can move certain blocks, certain blocks will explode when you touch them, mm-hmm. other blocks are static in place. So someone has to work out what those mechanics are and how they're presented to the player. And then to go a step further, the level design on that game was the puzzles. Where are the blocks placed? How does the player interact with them? What does the player do? Yeah. Um, 
yeah that, so the yeah the 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 distinction between design and development can be a confusing one um especially when you're starting out because game design game development they sound similar, they sound similar <laughs> um, and and they they kind of when when you're not aware of you know the context it can it can be a little bit confusing for sure um so is um wait so is the term white boxing is that more what side is that more on then uh white boxing can be an environment art and a level design thing i like to think of this is a, maybe a controversial statement okay. but i like to think of the white boxing process is um is pretty much the level designer's domain um yeah you know a, a lot of environment artists will say oh i'm doing the block out for okay. like an environment they're doing they and it is correct they are blocking out the level um but on a production uh, when gameplay comes first, it's it's important for a designer to do it because they're thinking about things like you know the leading lines, the weenies, the um, uh, the the level flow, the introduction of mechanics, um, all of those little little bits and bobs that you know all come together to free, form the level and the gameplay experience. Yeah. Um, so if the level designer handles that, you know, there's less um, there's less you're leaving less to chance. Um, mm -hmm. and it's more it's more bespoke and um, and useful that way but but like you said uh that, that's a good question because it can be confused you know level designers and environment artists will both do block outs in their time but if you're a professional uh environment artist slash professional level designer um that sorry that makes literally no sense if you're a level designer and mm -hmm. you work with environment artists you are a big studio like whether it's uh, I, I really try not to name drop all my my friends studios and stuff. <laughs> okay. um but um yeah, you'll you'll be the level designer will be doing the block out, and the environment artist will be adding to it mm -hmm. usually. Yeah. Whoa, because that, that, okay, that makes it's making sense. It's just like because I understand there's so many different titles because so is, yeah yeah like this is always the thing because so are these technically all different titles as in different roles? So you've got level design, you've got mm -hmm. um, game design, and game development. Would you would you say that's three different jobs? Uh, so any, I would say. Anyone who works on a game is a game developer. So, um, but then, like you said, level designer, mission designer, those are two different, uh, can be two different jobs, but sometimes yeah. will be one different job. Yeah. This is the weird one with game design because whatever studio you go for, your job will be slightly different. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard of level designers um, who do prop placement, whereas that's a big no no for us. Yeah. We, we don't do prop placement because. Um, like world building in a way. Yeah, it's, it's the environmental storytelling. And, and yeah. some places, they want the level designers to do that. Whereas other places, um, you know, it's not as important. O obviously, the level designer can do a little bit of environmental storytelling. We do loads of that on Sniper. Um, but it's not, you know, it wouldn't be my job to, say, work out where all the foliage goes on a level. Mm -hmm. um, that's down to the environment artist because that's their skills. That's what they're talented at. You know, yeah. I, my, my job is all about... Uh, the gameplay flow and and how how the player experiences the space, you know, mm -hmm. um, and the and the core gameplay for sure. Um, Perfect. But yeah, there's there's the the thing about this sort of thing is this is one of the real advantages of going to university. You're surrounded by people who have got this like game development vocabulary and these they know all these terms and you're going to be surrounded by these people all the time. So you're always like learning the new the the, the correct terminology. Mm -hmm. And you're applying it as well, whereas if you buy yourself, you might not, you know, learn. Um, you might not know, learn the details um, as quite as easily. Yeah, of course, not perfect answer, because like at the day, like there's so many, uh, like you said, like, there's so many things going on in a game. Like there's so many different roles, there's so many different titles. Oh, yeah. You name it, yeah. it's sometimes incredibly it's, hard to keep up. It's absolutely mad. I I think gaming as a hobby and then as a job as well is is basically like like someone's life life's work yeah um it is it is so vast and so deep um i i, I am forever forever learning and yeah. i am i am i sometimes i'm i'm reading or like you know i'm, I'm watching a video or, or sort of doing some research or something and, and i get this like overwhelming feeling of like oh there's literally thousands of more of these to read <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just building up and building up yeah <laughs> and it, it, it's yeah yeah it's this part part of the course you know it's um 
you know part of the job really yeah um, well in that case let's change let's get some energy going then so let's get some okay. dungeons and dragons okay. going oh my god right. so quickly let me get my dice let, let, here we go right so dungeons and dag <laughs> uh, dungeons and dragons so we're talking story here people this is going to be like the, the main thing about oliver we're going to be talking about uh, story you name it so first of all just tell me why you love dungeons and dragons because i thought it was really cool to talk about it. i've never played it but yeah, tell yeah, me about yeah. it Oh, it's an incredible game. Um, uh, for me, it's about creating a character, maybe in your own likeness, or maybe embellishing parts of yourself, or downplaying some elements. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I love taking on these characters and then, you know, sharing a story with a group of friends. You know, um, we went on um, an amazing adventure in my, at the end of my third year, and okay. um, there was a, a Goliath barbarian named Kunga. There was a, a warlock named Avarice the Proud. And there was um, there was a, so awesome. halfling, a halfling. Uh, there was a halfling called Almop Gaybar, and there was also um, and there was also Maximilian Mirioto, um, a Gensai um, shape shifting uh, malarkey kind of guy. And okay. you know, we we the the stories we created, the things we did as as a party and as a, as a as a, a group of players, mm-hmm. you know, we we're con- whenever we meet up that group of friends, we're always like, oh, do you remember do you remember when this happened? And I was like, oh, no way, I can't I can't believe we pulled that off. Or I was like, we absolutely dropped the ball on that one. Yeah, and nice. um, you know, it's it's it is just such a creative, it's such a great little creative outlook because um, it's it's you know, it's got game design it's got acting um it's got discovery it's got narrative um yeah. dungeons and dragons is 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 and always will be a very special hobby to me um awesome. and you know we built we built those characters and you know i i'm so fond of the characters we created from those games and they'll always be very special to me yeah like I, i'll need to give it a go sometime i've never done it man absolutely like, i've never it played it yeah, you've got to you've got to try it at least, at least especially once. if you get a nice group together with with um with, different groups have different play styles but our group was very role play heavy so mm-hmm. we all did character voices and oh, um, <laughs> you know when, when characters got drunk they we would actually like <laughs> role play being drunk and stuff and yeah. um, we'd share food at the table and um, in character and stuff and you know, we would every morning when our characters would would wake up for from the previous day of adventuring, we'd all go down and have you know breakfast together in the in yeah. in this like pr- like role playing all this stuff and um yeah yeah I, it's massively nerdy but I I'm, I'm after a all big that, fan. even better because <laughs> yeah. like, that's the thing because the reason why I want to bring it up is uh, because I day is like game designers are like storytellers. There's mm-hmm. so much things involved and there's so many great. Um, like you touched uh, on it earlier, which is amazing here, was themes. Is like you can dive into anything, whether it's simple, whether it's incredibly in depth, whether it's like yeah, something yeah. that's an RPG world, and there's like literally every armor you name it, absolutely anything. And it's like your ability to create, and it's just your your imagination. Like go wild with it, because on a day like when we we're talking here about like level design and like level design obviously like there's so many ways to design a level there's so many things going on whether it's just like uh, a linear uh, gameplay or whatever it is whatever's going on um, your ability to just think out the box and just oh, yeah, go yeah. mental is the best yeah. thing you know what i mean yes because you you're creatively solving problems that mm-hmm. um that was a question i got in my interview actually um oh, nice. and i'll always remember it because um i've never uh, I, I, it, it just really resonated with me. The question was, what do you think, um, what is game design to you? You know, what is it? And I stopped and I, I, I was like, I had, I had to think about it for a little second. And um, to me, the true answer to that question is game design is um, solving problems creatively with art and technology. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm a big believer in that. And, you know, being able to craft those stories and those worlds and, um, those play experiences for your players, you know, what more can you ask for as a exactly. as a creative outlook? Perfect. Uh, what what an answer. Because uh, like when it came to like the story side of things, like this is one thing. Like I really hope lots of um, uh, the uh, environment artists who are subscribed to the channel are listening mm. in because I think this is it's so important because there's more to just making an environment. Like there's so much things like creating story. Yeah. And it's yes. just like it'd be kind of cool to hear your thoughts on like for example if you actually had to give an environment artist some tips on how to make their maybe environment more playable what would you say about that oh my gosh that is an amazing question um 
I, I I'm actually a big believer in um, some cross-discipline skills um, mm-hmm. and and having a vague understanding of what other people do in their job. Yeah. Um, if I was to give some tips, though, um, I would think about um, a nice one is always make something make something come alive in the scene, whether it even if it's as simple as you know um, just some dust particle effects or you know a waterfall in the distance. Mm-hmm. You know, really really something that brings the scene to life is always amazing because. Um, it makes it feel that little bit more real. You know, we, we as humans, we love things that, that are animated and are moving. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just sort of captivates you a little bit. Um, and then other stuff is um, to make an environment more playable. Think about, don't just think about that, that beauty shot. Think about how the player is actually going to navigate from point A to point B. Yeah. Um, there's a guy called Peter Field who um, works at Media Molecule. And um, he actually gave this level design tip of sculpting your terrain before you put any buildings down. So, Ooh, uh, and the way, the reason to do that is you get this amazing uh, variation in your elevation and your height it changes. Um, and you can you can you can obviously massively edit that terrain later down the line. But but having a base for your terrain is so important. And then another tip as well: plot a start point and an end point. As soon as you've got those two points on the map. Um, it is. It becomes that much easier to understand what the player is doing in that space because you've got start and end. Yeah. Whatever happens in between, you can work out. But you know, just having the finish and the end, you know, it, it, it helps you a great deal. Those are both tips from Peter, so I've totally ripped him off. <laughs> but I'm sure I'm sure he won't mind because yeah, he's um, a fan, fantastic, experienced um, level designer, and um, you know. Has offered me some great advice and, uh, as well, so I'm sure he won't mind that. Um, as as for some some Oliver Walker little tips. Awesome, um, here we go. <laughs> um, so you, your environmental storytelling um, can be really, really, really light. You know, whether it's you know you put two mugs of coffee on a table, or it can be one of the mugs is knocked over, or um, something that's that small and that that detailed. Mm-hmm. You know, you can tell those micro stories. It doesn't have to be, you know, like you know, there's a skeleton here and it's fallen over and it was writing its last words on a napkin. Um, yeah. You can do you can do all kinds of stuff, but sometimes just a little bit is a little bit less can be a bit more. Mm-hmm. And then um, the the big one I really like, and I, I've this is going to be in a number of the levels on Sniper when it when it comes out is. Um, really breathtaking views that not only uh, are visually appealing but they allow for the objectives of the mission to naturally unfold Ooh, so right, okay, um, nice. I'm liking where this is going. I, I can't i can't quite give any okay. um, ex- examples of this because i would spoil the wonderful game we've worked on yeah but um uh, the the ones i really like are um when when you as a level designer help the environment artists do their job by by in the white box trying to create some beautiful views and create some beauty shots yeah um because then you 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 can play off each other um and really collaborate um nicely yeah. but yeah those, those are some those would be my little like um my little level design environment art um tips and tricks and Perfect. stuff um no that just reminded me it was the same i've been talking so much about uncharted lately and mm-hmm. uh, it just reminds me. You know, me... P- Peter did. Um, Peter worked for Naughty Dog, actually. Oh, so, yo, okay. yeah. Oh, makes sense. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So no wonder it came to mind. Yeah. So, yeah. Clearly, Peter, you're a legend. We love you, Peter. Um, it's just like um, I just remember. It's like uh, obviously it happens so many times. It happens in games all the time. But it's just like you know when you're like uh, um, climbing something in Uncharted, and then suddenly like you you've put so much work to get into this destination, and then suddenly the mm. camera just pans, and you just see the this the, the, the massive jungle, and it just slows oh cinematic. My God. You're, you're just that like, is Whoa. that is I I can't believe you've just said that because. Um, I was giving a talk last week, and so was Peter. Yep. And that was one of the things that he mentioned in Is his it? talk. What exactly what you just <laughs> described um, as one of his tips for level designers. So you know, obvious. Obviously, you know the proof is in the pudding. You can see it working. Of course. Um, but yeah, it's, it's amazing that, stuff. It's like that fulfillment because it's like that was the yeah. reward in the way. It's like yeah, that was like the go to. It's just like to see what's going on. If you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. Like, it, it it's about it's about the player's understanding of the space definitely. and the player intrinsically understand space because they're you know a human being who exists in 3d space yeah. so when, when a video game realizes those things it is it's truly amazing um perfect so before we get into the fun random section of the podcast i've got one last question 
Uh, oh. This is probably like the question that you probably expected me to say at the start, but I wanted to kind of get all the really juicy, awesome stuff out first. Um, so mm-hmm. the one everyone always asks is like, what's like the typical software? What kind of things do you, like tools, etc. do you think has helped you over the years? Uh, so I'm a massive Unity user. Okay. I'm obsessed with Unity. I think it's a fantastic editor. Um, I, I, I think if you're making cool stuff, it doesn't matter what you make it in. Of but I, I've, I've always used Unity. Um, I have used Unreal in the past as well um, for some projects, but um, only, only a f- drop in the bucket compared to my stuff in Unity. Mm-hmm. Um, then for my white boxing, I use Maya. Um, I'm actually trying to move over to Blender because everything I do in Maya can be done in Blender. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've been meaning to do it for a long time now, and I'm just it's just if I can if I could you know pull a pull like sort of like 25 hours out of my hat, mm-hmm. it would be really nice to to get stuck into Blender. Um, Photoshop, I use Photoshop for you know general uh, image manipulation and my uh, 2D maps and that sort of thing. Um, and then a notebook, I never forget my notebook. Oh, if yeah, I'm going course. over to have a conversation with someone. Um, I always bring my notebook, whether I think I need it or not. I always bring it with me because yep. um, writing stuff down for me is uh, so important to the job. Yep. You know, I'll, I'll I'll always have a list of stuff that I need to do, and I like to cross it off on paper rather than on you know a computer or whatever. I yep. I, I find a physical notebook super important for a designer. Definitely, uh, I'm the exact same. <laughs> I've got my notebook books there. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I just realised. Uh, so thank you for diving into that. So, um, and uh, like um, Oliver was saying, is it, uh, and uh, like, there's so many software. It's down to what you feel is comfortable. For yeah, you. yeah. It's it, it's about yeah. It's about what you what you know, what you have your hours in, and um, it's about what you produce at the end of the day. You know, I'm. Yeah. You know, no one's looking. You know, if you look at the AAA games, no one's like, hey, that one's Frostbite, that one's Unreal, that one's um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Unity. People are just looking at the games that they've created. You know, very. I don't think a lot of gamers particularly care what editor their game is made in. Yeah. You know, as long as as long as the player experience is what they're looking for, yeah. um, that's the important thing. Amazing. So I realised uh, there was one topic. So uh, we were talking about the start, uh, Oliver. So mm-hmm. there's one important topic that we're wanting to talk about today. Sure, uh, yes. So talk about bipolar, and talk about yeah, mental, yeah. mental health, etc. Um, mm-hmm. So first of all. Um, as always, we all go through different experiences, etc. A lot of people have things at different levels. And um, I had the pleasure to talk to Oliver about this at the start. And uh, we're going to be diving into just uh, his experience, etc. And I'm going to tie in some of my stories, etc. And how to get better mm-hmm. with it. So first things first, uh, just tell us a wee bit about, about, like, I guess we'll just start off with the uh, advice on how to deal with certain things. Like, what have you learned through the yeah. past? Yeah. Um... Yeah. So, so yeah, like you said, um, so I, I have bipolar and I'm, I'm always happy to talk about this because I believe it's, it's, it's important not to shy away from it and pretend that it's not, um, part of my life and something, um, because, uh, I think if we have to talk about mental health, because, um, if we don't, there's a lot of people out there who are going to suffer a lot more because of it. Yeah. Um, f- for me, it's a, it's about being mindful and, and understanding that, I'm not always going to be 100%, you know, I, and that that really upsets me because I um I like to I like to portray that I'm I've got my shit together and I'm mm-hmm. a, a a cool competent dude, but sometimes, you know, I my mental health does take a hit and you know, I have to take time to recover and, you know, not not push myself too hard because if you if you don't, you can make yourself like quite quite seriously ill mm-hmm. and you know, you won't be able to create the things you love and you won't be able to live, you know, a full and normal life. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's like the sort of overview of things, really. But, yeah, is there, is there anything, uh, anything, any more, anything you'd like more information on or anything like that? Well, or First uh, of all, I really appreciate your opinion uh, about it and saying that because, uh, like you said, uh, there's not many people talk about it. And, yeah, um, yeah. for example, when I was talking to my podcast, so I've talked about three episodes uh, so far, uh, when I was going through uh, like very dark times, but I've always been mm-hmm. one of those people that I'm very just. Uh, I've always been very honest. If you know, what I mean, I'm always like, right. If I need to get something, uh, get better, improve that, right. Get to the solution as quickly as possible, and try and mm-hmm. move forward all the time. And I understand that people obviously have different moods, etc. And I was saying to you about my my mum, etc. Um, at the yeah, start yeah. Uh, before the podcast went live. And when it comes to mental health, um, the best thing. Uh, and then it's always the hardest thing is the first step and taking that first step whether it's talking to someone uh, it only takes one person like I always have like that go-to person uh, or I have a few people I can be like right I know I could talk to them about anything yeah 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 like no matter what 
and like that goes such a long way just just a small chat it could be only five minutes and that yeah. would have just eased your whole day yeah i th- i completely agree i i think i think one thing we can all do you know when when you know someone who you can obviously tell is struggling or maybe they've had something something quite big happen to them you know just like really truly asking someone like hey man like is everything okay can we please talk you know yeah. like if, if we all made the effort to do that it would make um it would make people's difficult times so much so much less difficult because yeah. they know that they've got someone to talk to maybe they're not ready to talk about it right away or anything but they you've opened the door for them you've said hey man like look that that door is always going to be open and as soon as you need it you know just come knocking and i'll, yeah. and I'll be there for you because you know I, I it's it's important to because people can get really really unwell really quickly if mm-hmm. they feel like they're alone in things and um yeah it's it's so it's essential it is absolutely essential because Definitely. because everyone's mental health is is really important and it shouldn't be ignored because the games industry is a stressful place it's hard it's, it can be really hard sometimes um and having that support and having people that have those conversations is going to make the industry a better place yeah like oh man you just remind me of some really cool stories right um so mm-hmm. when it came to this is one thing that i love to do and uh, this is not me just trying to say this just because it sounds really positive but this is one of the things i truly think is like the coolest experience you can ever have right so say you see someone who's maybe a bit shy and a bit nervous right so i was doing a presentation uh, for a college and then also a university and um, there was so many people you could tell they were like, do you like you were saying that when you were at college, you were like the mm-hmm. person at the mm-hmm. front of the class going, I want a question, I got a question, let's let me speak. And uh, like, I was always yeah, that type yeah. of person. But then you get the people mm-hmm. who are like, very shy and stuff. And um, I love it, right? This is the most rewarding feeling ever is when you go up to someone who's shy and nervous and you just get them out of their comfort zone. As in like oh, yeah. you turn them around. So like I was talking to this person um, talking to this uh, young woman, incredibly um, a talented person. Uh, she was very quiet and very shy. And then I just said, I, I was like teaching, I was showing her something in Maya and she just completely switched. And it was like, like she was teaching me things and she was geeking yeah. out and her her mind just like, you can just tell she starts start smelling. It was the best feeling ever. It's like, if you yeah. guys have someone that you're studying at say university and uh, maybe they're um, the quite quiet person, Go up to them, give them a, a good old conversation. Yeah. Like at the day, like you don't know what to expect. Like they may be the coolest person on the planet. You just and they've, don't know. they've probably got stuff to teach you as well. Exactly. You know, every, everyone out there has stuff to teach you, no matter where, yeah. what walk of life they're from. Um, you know, I couldn't agree more with that. That's a really, really nice thing. Um, oh, it's it's just it's just it's just the uh, the and then it's like the contrast. Like do you like when they say opposites attract? Mm-hmm. So like one uh, like one of my best friends. So uh, he's a very uh, like he's a confident person, but he doesn't say that much. And then there's me, yeah. who's just like, "What's up, Matthew?" And then <laughs> you just have me, Mister Loud Person. He's just like, "Ross, calm down. Like, are you okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. bro?" And I'm like, "Dude, I'm just I'm just being mean." He's like, "Cool." It, it just makes so much sense. Like, yeah, yeah. Our conversations just flow so easily. Yeah, and I get uh, you. it's just that's like the best feeling ever. So if you ever have someone that maybe you, like you think you can change their day because like, it's what Oliver was saying. Like you don't know what's happening. It's like five minutes of any time can go such a long way. And uh, mm-hmm. I think everyone, uh, do your best to just reach out, get involved, make people feel involved. Like that's the thing. Like when it comes to group projects, so this is why I like group projects. Is you get to kind of realize not just what people are like and what it, what it's like to work in a team, but you once again, obviously, you get to know people and you get to kind of just get the personality thing because it's not really about making just the best game it's about actually just like the experience of being together and it's just like mm-hmm. that's just mm-hmm. a, a great thing to kind of summarize uh i'm not sure if there's anything I, else you want yeah, to say the, the, no the joys of collaboration man absolutely i i can't you know i i've loved um since leaving university like um meeting up with old friends to lead little game jam teams and stuff mm-hmm. because the the energy you get from a group of creatives uh, especially with various different disciplines is amazing you know i yeah. i um i do a lot of jams with a guy called lewis barn and he is just like the best um 
like not just like sound designer but he mm-hmm. is just the best to bounce ideas off because i'll be sitting like programming and designing and like e- doing stuff in the engine and he'll be working on all the sounds and i'll be like i'll like roll over to him on my chair and like tap him on the shoulder and like hey man like what if we did what if we did this what if we had a hundred guys on screen yeah. they're all chasing the cursor around Ooh. and he's like oh my <laughs> god we've got to do it and i'm like yeah we have got to do it um so awesome. yeah um finding those those people to collaborate with is just uh it's just amazing and yeah. like you you might find that the people you work best with are the people you expect it from least and yeah. maybe they are a bit more shy and and less forthcoming but that doesn't mean they don't have brilliant ideas and potential of course oh that, this is an awesome way to tie on to the next so uh thank you so much by the way for everything that you've said in the podcast man it's been an absolute pleasure uh, having no you problem on. at all a pleasure for me as well it's for really really um put a smile on my face and um, <laughs> perfect I, love doing this stuff so uh, it's, my, it's my pleasure also so yeah great to hear thank you so much so um as always man so i was telling you briefly um at the start of the podcast there so i so basically it's called 500 seconds but it's not so basically it's like almost like non-stop questions of random subjects you name it oh my gosh uh, so right. favorite game and then something you'll suddenly just come like twist around and you're like wait what question is this and then just be ready it's gonna be a lot of fun <laughs> all right all right okay, i'm ready right, I'm so gonna... we'll start off with the easy one either. <laughs> uh, favorite game it might be the hard one but favorite game yeah, Hotline, Miami. Hotline Miami probably uh, wait what's yeah. it called sorry Hotline Miami uh, Miami Hotline Miami have you oh, heard of it I, I've not heard of this tell, tell me about this Hotline Miami was one of the indie darlings of its year it was like Devolver Digital's breakout indie game mm-hmm. and you play uh, a dude in an animal mask going on like a rampage in Miami and it is right? like pixel, pixel art and it's like neon and it is the most high energy game ever and then so the first game is like this high energy uh, absolute madness mm-hmm. and then the second game is like the hangover to the first game and it it goes into some really like like dark and like bizarre places and you see the broken remnants of characters from the first game and like what they've become and it's um it's got some amazing moments in it especially you know playing the game when it first came out and then waiting for the sequel and then seeing how it all tied up in the sequel, I was just like, "Oh my god, this is this is the indie darling for me." Yeah, you're sorted. <laughs> that's great because like, well, that's always the thing. Because like, when I do this section of the podcast, it's like it just makes me realize like, how little do I know. Like, there's so much things out there. I like, was just like, <laughs> yeah, "Yeah, I need to start getting more." Podcasts. I I am obsessed with podcasts, so um, I totally get that. So every every podcast I listen to, I'm like like cr- trying to cram that stuff into my brain. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. that's that's the beauty of it though. Is like what uh, because it's um I, I it's my own podcast. It's like I get to learn so much. Like this is a like yeah, seven, yeah. like I'm almost at eighty podcasts. It's like I've learned from eighty say, people. I was, I was about to say it must be it must be a really unique experience running a podcast. Oh, dude, I absolutely love it. I think it's so good. Um, right. So the next one, right? This one's going to be dependent to see if you've seen them or not. So, out of these three options, what is your favorite? Cartoon Network, mm-hmm. Disney Channel, or Jetix? Mm-hmm. Have you had to choose? Oh my one? god! I I used to love Jetix as a oh, kid. Oh yes, I'm so glad you said I, that. I I they had I was obsessed with a game called Mega Man Battle Network as a kid. Ooh, it was right? one of my all time favorites, and they actually had like an anime of it on Jetix. And I was like, I was playing this game, and I I played like a bunch of the games in the series, and I was like, this is the coolest game, and I'm so obsessed with it. Yeah. And then I was on holiday, and we had Jetix on the on the like on the Freeview channel and stuff, and I was watching it, and then they were like, next up, Mega Man Battle. Network. Oh, network anime <laughs> and i was like what are how does this exist I don't, yeah. it was amazing so based on just that little that little story alone i'm gonna go jetix oh man yeah. i'm so happy because that was my answer because uh did, have you ever watched galactic football oh my god please <laughs> say yeah, i do remember that that show was absolutely mental that was absolutely. my thing crazy show i it, it, the premise is really bizarre as well because it's like it's like football in space gone wild. Yeah, exactly. Like, who, who's the, who's the demographic for this? But I'm so about it. I'm so yeah. I'm in. I'm oh. in. I'm invested. Dude, so when I was um, so I played football literally growing up my whole life, and uh, I was like, uh, it must have been when I was twelve at the time when I came across this, and I was like, Dad, you're not gonna believe what's on show right now. And he was like, What? Football in space, and you can do like a hundred foot backflip. Like um, overhead kicks, and my dad was like, "I'm all for it." Like I was watching this with my dad, and then my dad's like, "What, forty at the time and stuff, or forty-five? Just like jamming, watching Galactic Football. It's so good, absolutely amazing show. Fantastic." 
Right. Uh, next one. Another random run. Would you rather be a vampire or a werewolf? Um. Hmm. I know my answer, but but I think mine's a. Well, there's like a, a few debates. I, I, I think I think both have their appeals, but I I think I would go vampire because it's a bit more like composed undertones of evil you know that's that's yeah. more my jam you know rather than you know the, the the wild rampage although i'm not uh i'm not beneath an absolute bender <laughs> <laughs> fair enough because they always think because like for me uh, it would be werewolf because like i don't know it's just i don't know if i could handle it being a, i think there's too much things going on as a vampire it's full time it's full time gig being a vampire isn't it yeah, Whereas it's the just werewolf, madness. Werewolf, you just like once a month go a bit mental like if it was vampire side of things it i think it depend on the vampire like for example I, um this is one film, right? Supposedly it's getting a lot of slap, but I loved Van Helsing. And some mm. people supposedly didn't like Van Helsing, but I thought Van Helsing was great. Like, yeah, it, yeah. Um, But like Vampire, I, that was, uh, I, I'd have to go Werewolf, man. But uh, I, yeah. like, good answer, though. Right, uh, yeah. next one. Would you rather... So this one, another interesting one. Would you rather fight along... So this, this is dependent if you've seen it. So would you rather fight along House Stark or the Avengers? <sighs> Oh, one one hundred percent House Stark. Oh, yeah, right, okay, be... interesting. Uh, because like, I will obviously try to no spoilers, but <laughs> yeah, like I will, we'll avoid spoilers. But man, like, um, like the the feeling of being like a medieval knight, you yeah. know, would be just that'd be really cool. Dramatic. You know, and uh, and it's it's a bit more it's a bit more raw and you know, um, less Hollywood than the whole Avengers thing. I I, I like Avengers, but you know, I'd I'd much rather be. You know, touching swords with Ned Stark and then charging, charging the front. Yeah, that is no, that's a good answer. I'll go. You've actually maybe switched now. Um, I'd actually probably go Stark now because uh, obviously superheroes are cool in that. But then again, if I was on their side, does that mean that, do I have a superpower? If you know what I mean? But I was gonna say, uh, like, I, I think the the thing that would change my mind on that answer would be if you like if you get to be like a like your personality as an avenger like yeah. you get to be like a new avenger that's quite appealing but That'd be um, cool. yeah so i'm i'm on the fence about that one but yeah awesome right uh favorite food uh oh i there is there are a few pleasures in life greater than me and uh just one just one other friend mm -hmm. um going for a curry just me and me and a good friend having yeah. a curry having a beer and having a good conversation and you know really uh, for me like uh, i love i love conversation and i love like a one-on-one -on -one chat because yeah, yeah, of course if you talk with just person to person you get to you get to explore the conversation exactly the way you want it to go whereas if you Definitely. have even three people the conversation can go all over the place and you know i, I love going for drinks and you know sitting around a table with a good group of people and yeah uh, chatting all, all kinds of nonsense but I, I love the personal feeling of sharing a meal or, or an, an Indian restaurant with um, a good friend. Yeah. Great answer. Awesome answer. Right. Oh, this one. So this one literally just came to mind yesterday because I was watching this uh, awesome uh, video. Is that actually, have you, have you ever heard of Tim the Tapman? I haven't actually, no. So Tim the Tapman is like a famous uh, Fortnite streamer who like plays with mm. Ninja, etc. And yeah, uh, yeah. He was, for some random reason, he was watching uh, a thing about the Mariana Trench and Mount Everest. So, mm -hmm. my question is, um, would you rather climb Mount Everest or go to the bottom of the Mariana Trench? Uh, that is actually an easy answer Ooh, because right, yes. the Mariana Trench is has never been explored before, right at the bottom of it. So, if, if I'm allowed to explore the Mariana Trench yeah. just by myself, it will be a place that no humans have ever been before. Well, so what? Wait, so are you saying that? What do you mean by they've not been been explored? So people, so I know I, James I Cameron's think... been to the bottom. He's been in like a submarine. Oh really? Is it? Wait, is it? Isn't the Mariana Trench the deepest point of the ocean? Yeah, it's the deepest. I point don't think we could. We wait. We've actually been able to go to the bottom of it. So it's happened twice. So basically, um, but then okay. again, going to your point though, it, your point it does make a lot of sense though. So in the first time, it was like. God, it must have been years ago. I think it, like this was such a shock. So I think it was 1964, and they had like mm -hmm. the oldest technology ever. And then James Cameron was like, right, um, I don't know what inspired him, but it was between the time of I think making Titanic and the and uh, Avatar, and mm -hmm. he was um, exploring new technologies, and he just decided out of the bloom to um, literally go in a submarine. And when he got all the way to the bottom, um, not only was the pressure insane. But um, things started freezing because he was oh, that low God. down. So he almost got trapped. 
um, <gasps> at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Oh my like, god! And the dog. Could you imagine what that would feel like? Oh, it would be madness. It like that was the thing. So like, do you mind people always ask like, would you rather uh, like space or the deep water? It's like deep water is like it, it's like I know it's going to sound so stupid, but it it's like the feeling of claustrophobic. You're literally yeah, yeah. I don't know. That'd be it, madness. It, it terrifies me thinking about submarines sometimes when mm-hmm. when I hear that people lived in submarines for months on end. Yeah. They literally lived in in like the most claustrophobic space possible yeah. for months, and that is just that's mad. Oh, Madness. It's just... I mean, maybe, maybe I play it safe. Actually, and just do Everest. It's on it. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like, nah, that's get, rid of, get rid of that trench. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll just climb the ice mountain. No, but it's a, it's a such safer uh, safer bet. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> right. So we've got uh, four. We've actually got five more questions. If that's okay. So yep, no problem. Uh, next one. Would you rather freeze time or teleport? Uh, oh, you could do so much with freezing time. You could just yeah. like freeze time, make a game, and then make a game. You could just you could just infinite time to make games. I've yeah. got free freeze time. <laughs> That's very true. Because you can you can just like let's say you can just freeze time and have a have a lion every day. Yep. <laughs> happy days you're sorted. Wait, does time wait, do you age while time is frozen? Actually, let's make it fun. Let's say you don't age. You don't age. Oh, that is perfect then because you could you could literally spend like three years in frozen time and make a game and then release it and then the next day release another game and then yep. the next day. <laughs> <laughs> that would gross. be you you could be you would like destroy the entire indie games market yeah. handedly. <laughs> Everything possible. You're like this guy's literally just like Mr. X. He knows everything. <laughs> oh my god, that'd be crazy. Uh, right, this one. Oh, this one makes me think because I have no idea which I'd choose. Uh, that's why I'm asking you the questions and not me. <laughs> <laughs> would you rather be stuck on a broken ski lift or on a broken elevator? Uh, so I don't like heights, but I'm still kind of inclined to choose the ski lift because, uh, I don't know, actually. The elevator is less terrifying, but the ski lift is a bit like, oh, no elevator because you'd be freezing as well. You'd be oh, really cold. Yeah, good point. Right, okay. I never thought about it. See that? I need to go into more depth about thinking about these questions. <laughs> ah, it's all good. It's, that's, that's why we have a designer here. <laughs> exactly. See, we've got the healthy balance, artists, and it, well, whatever I do versus what you do. <laughs> So, uh, next question. Uh, Antarctica or the Sahara Desert if you were to be trapped? Um, I bet you didn't expect these questions today. It's like, uh, I thought I was just going to be talking about game design. <laughs> I was going to say we're going places, aren't we? Um, I think it, you would be so thirsty in the Sahara. Yeah. You would be so cold and it would be dark in there's, the antarctic there's only one thing that i realize is like a wee bit of a cheat so the sahara is cold at night uh is it's true but that's the only but then again it's still like where do you get the water though well it's like yeah. there's, there's so many caveats but i'm interested to see you'd, have to, you'd have to find cacti wouldn't you and squeeze the moisture yeah, out of them exactly. um i think i'm gonna go sahara yeah because I, that, that's rocking a hard place that cho- that choice there's no yeah, correct answer definitely right so we've got two more questions so, would you rather a lifetime supply of food or a mm-hmm. lifetime supply of clothes? What kind of food do you get? Is it like, do you, you just get like anything, basic? anything, everything, and then infinite clothes of your choice? Oh my gosh. I'm going to go with clothes, but I'm... Uh, dress, like you could have a different outfit every single day. That would be you? sick. Like new clothes, like like just new like suit, can... new tuxedo. Yeah. Oh my god, that'd be dope. Yeah, you could dress like Tyler Durden every <laughs> single day. Um, hmm. But the food one is just like you never have to worry. You could be like you could invite all your friends over for like a feast. Uh, yeah, true. Yeah, very true. Um, the food one's more social. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, I I think. Hmm. It, this, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna go food time. because it's it's a biological requirement okay good and answer you, yeah no. that'll do that'll, we'll go with that yeah. go with food good choice right so this one so the last question i always ask every uh, podcast is always about animals but uh, so i always like to ask like if you could have any animal in the animal kingdom as a pet what would you choose and um, that's really small like roughly the same size as a laptop however mm-hmm. i decided to switch it have you ever heard of his dark materials i've heard of it i have heard of it but i am not familiar with it Right, so there's one thing about his dark materials. This is not really a spoiler because it's literally everything about his dark materials. Uh, if you're okay, we'll be saying it. So, that is totally fine. So his dark materials, basically there's a, a thing called a demon. 
and it's like the pet that has to be with you all the time and basically there's like a whole kind of life uh, scenario with that pet that affects your life so basically like you're you have to always be together so if you mm -hmm. could have any pet that would be that demon for you what would it be and why gosh um so like you could have like a tiger oh you could God. have like so, i don't know a oh, fantasy creature there's, there's, anything. Um, i've got i think uh, uh, it's a bit of a, uh, i don't know if it's a bit of a cop out but i was gonna say mm -hmm. there's this motivational speaker and mm -hmm. he's a he's a shiba Ooh, a japanese right. shiba and he gives little motivational he can talk as well he's a talking shiba okay um and he gives motivational motivational speeches he says things like um you've got <laughs> I, I won't i won't do his voice because it's oh, very right, yeah. funny but he <laughs> says he says things like um if you've got a dream you've got to chase it and he says yeah. things like that and i and whenever i whenever i'm having my low moments i always watch them Perfect. so it'd be kind of great to have him just like a little shiba yeah. who but he's 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 a bit awkward but he's he's a real got a real can do attitude yeah always he's, positive he's, he's always positive he always wants you to succeed you know He's like a, the best cheerleader, yeah. and I like Shivas. They are absolutely adorable. Awesome. They're the closest, closest relevant uh, living uh, relative to wolves, though, in the in the, the dog family. Mm -hmm. That's why they're so naughty. Uh, amazing answer. Awesome. <laughs> Dude, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. <laughs> it's man. my pleasure, Ross. What, what, what an awesome way to end it there. What a great answer. So thank you so much, by the way, for coming on. And uh, Absolute e pleasure. Yeah. Everyone who's been tuning into the podcast, make sure to check out his work. Um, as we've been uh, talking, uh, you would have seen everything to do about him on the slideshow, playing on the background. So all his uh, games, you name it, it'll be showcased as you're uh, seeing it, um, as the discussion's gone along. Uh, make sure to check out his social media platforms. Uh, all links will be in the description, as always. If you guys are tuning in on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Make sure to smash the like button, as always, and don't forget to turn on notifications, as always, to be notified every single week when the podcast is live. And with that said, folks, we will see you guys in the next episode. Bye for now.